the, actually the second book that I've written is called How to Walk on Water. But that's not the end of the title. It says How to Walk on Water, Move Mountains, or any other impossible thing that God might ask you to do. Okay? So, um, how many of you have walked on water before? Any of you walked on water? <laughs> yeah? Okay. I, th I think it's probably true that all of us have walked on water. So the first thing we want to look at, let me see if we can uh, get this thing to work here. What does it mean to walk on water? Well, I think there's many times when all of us have walked on water and it's nothing supernatural or miraculous about it because anytime it rains or somebody splashes water on a sidewalk or something, you walk on water, right? But it's, it's not just the water you're walking on. It's something else underneath that's holding you up, right? And in, as a matter of fact, even when we go out uh, you know, on a frozen lake, we're walking on water, right? Any of you ever walked on a frozen lake or anything else frozen? Yeah, you're walking on water then, right? And the water's actually holding you up in that case, right? And so it's not like we've never walked on water, but the kind of walking on water that we're talking about today what we see in the Bible goes beyond that because when Jesus walked on water, he wasn't walking on a wet sidewalk or ice, right? What was he walking on? He was walking on the surface of a lake, right? And it's the same lake that these guys were trying to cross in a boat, right? And they were having big trouble crossing it in the boat. Okay? So that's the kind of walking on water. And walking on water has also become a metaphor for things that God asks us to do that we couldn't do without him, right? And that's the kind of walking on water we're really talking about this morning when it comes to, you know, how can you walk on water? How can you do things that God is asking you to do that you couldn't do without his help? All right, so that's what we're going to look at. So let's take a look at the passages here where we see Jesus walking on water. If you have your Bibles there, there's actually three places, three Gospels that talk about this. Matthew 14, starting in verse 22, and we've got Mark 6, starting in verse 45, and John 6, starting in verse 16. When Jesus was walking on water, as described in these passages, he was walking out on this lake that these, these guys were having trouble crossing in a boat, right? Now, you've got to remember, these disciples, there were 12 of these guys out there, and several of these guys had been very experienced with boats, right? They, they were out there, and uh, they knew what they were doing, some of these guys, and yet they were having trouble. And so, why were they having trouble? Okay, well, let's see. What, was the, what were the weather conditions like that they were dealing with out there? Anybody remember from the passage? They were terrible, okay? Very stormy. In fact, if you look at uh, John's pas uh, passage here in John 6, in verse 18, it says, A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. Okay, so even these experienced guys were having trouble walking, or not walking, but boating on this water, right? Because, as it says in Matthew 14, 24 here, the waves were buffeting. It says there, the waves, because the wind was against it. And so the, it was being buffeted by the waves. Okay, waves are pounding up against this boat. Now, the lake that they were on, you know, there have been some people who have tried to sort of explain Jesus walking on water by saying, oh, well, it was just, you know, a small lake somewhere. And, uh, you know, it was probably by the shore and he probably knew where the rocks were. You know, you hear that story. <laughs> or... Uh, maybe, you know, I, I was reading an article here the other day that's, that's talking about, well, we think we know how he did it. It got icy sometimes over there on that lake, and he found where the ice was, okay? But that wasn't it either, because if you read the passage, this is a lake that's, you know, eight miles across and like 13 miles long and uh, 33 miles of shoreline all around. This is a huge lake. Average depth, I read, I think, was something like... Uh, Let's see, what was it, 50-some um, feet deep or something, or 80 feet deep or something, average, right? So there's deeper spots. So this is a huge lake. In fact, they say it's about the size of Washington, D.C. This lake is about the size of Washington, D.C. Okay, so it's not just a little lake that they were at. And if you read the passage, they were trying to get across this lake, 
And they were out about the middle of the lake. They'd been out, you know, three or four miles out into this lake. And so, you know, these other explanations about what was going on, Jesus was doing something obviously quite miraculous when he was walking across the water. Okay? So it was rough. By the way, let's see the next question here. What time of the day was it when they were doing this? Yeah, it was... So they were doing this at nighttime, and we're getting close to dawn even. Okay? So they'd been at it for a while out there in the middle of this lake, and they're, they're struggling because of the wind and all those kind of things. And uh, why were the disciples out there on the lake? You ever thought about that? Who told them to? Yeah, this wasn't even their idea. Right? This was Jesus' idea. He told them to go cross the lake. Now, where was Jesus? He was on shore. says he was praying, right? And so, now you, if you remember the last time they'd tried to cross the lake and they were having trouble, Jesus was with them, right? But Jesus wasn't with them this time. And so, it says in verse 22 here of Matthew 14 that uh, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead on the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Okay, this was Jesus' idea. That's why they were out there on the lake. Now, if you think about that, if you were one of Jesus' disciples, it wasn't your idea to go out on the lake and do this, right? It was his idea, and you were just doing what he told you to do, and you're having all this trouble. Okay, what would be your state of mind as you were going across this lake? Okay, what state of mind can you imagine those might be questioning yeah, first, of all, yeah, where are you, Jesus? Why did you tell us to go out here and do this? I mean, didn't he know it was going to be bad for us out here? In fact, the title of the chapter in my book that we're looking at this morning is, Why Does God Ask Us to Do Hard Things? Because that's what he, Jesus had asked him to do something that was hard. And, and when were they doing this? Well, the day, yeah, it was at night, but the day before, you know, before night came, what was going on that day? The feeding of the 5,000. Now, do you think that might have been a stressful time for those disciples? Yeah, a lot of stuff going on there. Their faith was being tested, for one thing, but they were the ones who, you know, uh, helped pass out the fish and the loaves and gather up the leftovers and all that. So it was a busy day. They're tired. It's way past their bedtime, all right? And they're out here in the middle of the lake, and they're there because Jesus told them to be there. I don't know about you. Have you ever felt in your life like Jesus had asked you to do something and it's like, now where are you? What am I doing here? Okay? That's, that's the kind of situation we're looking at here. Now, you've got to keep in mind also for these disciples, Jesus had been doing miracles before this, right? So one of the things we saw here is in Matthew 8, and this is where the last time they were out in the boat, Jesus was with them, big storm came up, Right? And they thought, oh man, we're going to sink. What did they do? They woke up Jesus and they said, don't you care that we're going to drown here? Okay? And what was Jesus' response? Do you remember? Oh, you little faith. Okay? And then he just said, you know, be, be still. And then it all quieted down and everything was taken care of. And then they probably at this time were thinking, why isn't he here with us so we can do that again? Right? That's what they'd really like to do here. They just see, seen him also feed the 5,000. So, what had Peter and these other disciples seen Jesus do prior to this experience of walking on the water? They'd seen him do all kinds of miracles, including calming the storm, including feeding 5,000. That, and that was just fresh in their mind. They just experienced that. Right? And what did they learn about Jesus as they saw him doing these miracles? Mighty God. Mighty God. What did, do you remember what they said? Or does somebody have the passage there in Matthew 8? Where, uh, what did they say about Jesus in uh, Matthew 8, 27 there? Even the wind and the sea obey him. Okay, so they knew what kind of man Jesus was, because they had experienced this before. They knew he could take 
a few fish and a few loaves of bread and feed 5,000 people. All right, so that, that's what's going on here. We're in the middle of a lake. We're, we think, I don't know if we're going to make it by. I wish Jesus was here. We know he could take care of it, but he's not here. All right, so let me ask you this. What have you seen Jesus do in your life? Okay, think about those things individually. And if somebody wants to share something, they can. Have you seen Jesus do miraculous kinds of things in your life? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the fact that he saved us from our sin is, the, you know, huge and for everybody here. Yeah. Uh, I think he saved me a few times from doing something stupid. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> We, yeah, yeah that's, I'm sure we could all say the same thing there. Uh, yeah, Jesus saves us from doing stupid things a lot of times, if we listen to him, anyway, right? Okay, so what have you learned about Jesus through what he's done in your life? That we can trust him, that you can put your faith in him, okay? It's not about us. Oh, he cares about us, okay? That he cares about us. Yeah, provides all of our needs regardless of what type of needs we have. Yeah. Never fails us, never forsakes us. We can learn those kind of things as we experience. And that's helpful for us when we find ourselves in situations like the disciples found themselves in there where, man, I'm, this is hard. I don't know if we can do this. And so when we learn, you know, Jesus is who we're looking Jesus for. does have a plan for our lives. That's another thing we can learn and that he's got, there's reasons why we go through what we go through. Okay? And I th I'm sure for these disciples here in this boat, there were reasons why they were going through what they were going through. Right? So let's go on here. Um, now, what miracle did they see Jesus do at, at this point in the story? Okay, so here they are struggling middle of the night, you know, almost dawn, and, and you know, things are going bad, um, and here comes Jesus, he's just walking across the water, okay, now what did they think? They thought they were looking at a ghost. Yeah, well, at first, they thought they were looking at a ghost, now, why would they come to that conclusion? Because people don't normally walk on water, right? And so that might be a more usual kind of, well, explanation, yeah. Um, the, uh, the, something that they knew was called the abyss, and there's a lot of, of demons in there. Okay. So they thought this was... Okay. Yeah, that word ghost that's used, sometimes it may be referring to something like that. Okay, so it's some kind of di demonic thing, spirit, they thought, okay, uh, obviously no person can be out there doing this, so wh what is this, right? That's kind of the way they're thinking, all right? So they think he's a ghost, he comes out there, and so how, how do they react? What's their fear, right? They're terrified. Would you be terrified? Probably. See somebody coming out of the dark here, and they're walking on water. And that's not normal. Jesus is walking on water. They think he's a ghost. Then what does Jesus do? He does what? Don't be afraid. But did he say it like, what's the matter with you guys? You shouldn't be afraid? No, it was a kind of a compassionate kind of a response where he realized that their fear was kind of normal, right? Because he was surprising them. I mean, that's not a normal kind of a thing. They weren't expecting something like that, right? So when he saw the disciples' fear, his response was kind of compassionate, right? Take courage, don't fear. And he says, it's me. It is I, right? So it, it's me, okay? And that's probably going to give them a lot of relief from their fear, you would think, because... Um, that's who they wished was that with him in the first place, right? He's not there. And they says, you know, it's me. All right. Yeah. And it, it's interesting in one of the passages here, it talks about the fact that Jesus could see them out there on the lake when he was still on land, right? And that's when he started to walk out to them. 
which, you know, they're several miles out there. It's dark. So, you know, must have been a miraculous kind of seeing them out there. Right? So, at that point, there's two of the three Gospels that let us know that at this point, uh, when Jesus said, you know, it is I, don't be afraid, they invited him into the boat. Okay? So they went from, ah, what is this? To, oh, come on in. All right, come on in. All right, so what do you think made the difference there? Why do you think the disciples were ready to allow Jesus into the boat, even though at first they thought he was a ghost? Okay, so they recognized him. They knew his power. His voice, maybe. Okay. Do you, do you think a ghost could imitate his voice? Hmm, I thought about that. Maybe, you know, were these disciples really sure? Well, there's an indication, and this is the only gospel that talks about this. In Matthew, in his account in, in chapter 14 there, we find that, uh, we, by the way, I skipped past one thing that I wanted to point out. Um, it, one of the passages here tells us that Jesus was going to pass them by. Okay? He, he was going to pass them by. It looked like he was just going to walk right past them. And they yelled, you know, ah, it's a ghost or whatever. And he said, oh, don't worry, it's just me, you know. Okay, so they're going out there, they, and they heard his voice, they believed him somehow. He must have been very convincing because they were ready to let him into the boat. However, in Matthew's passage, we see something else that happened that would be even more convincing than just his voice, right? What happened in Matthew's account? Right. So, here's Peter, and this, this has always amazed me how Peter's response was, okay? I think I would have been more like the other guys who just said, oh, come on in the boat, right? But Peter, instead of saying, oh, come on in the boat, he's saying, well, help me come out on the water. If it is you, okay? It's like, I want some proof that it's you. I thought probably would have come up with some other kind of proof, like, you know, if it's you, let me, let me just know it's you because uh, tell me the exact words you used when you called me to come from fishing into co <laughs> or something like that. Well, I didn't have to go out on the water to find out. You know what I'm saying? Okay. But that's not how Peter did it. So, why do you think Peter wanted to do it this way? You, have any, you ever thought about that? Oh, yeah, he was a big mouth. <laughs> He was uh, kind of impulsive, right? I mean, you look at this, he was very impulsive. Okay, so, and this is one of the key things I want us to, to think about in this passage. Here is, uh, you know, these 12 guys in a boat, struggling, fearful. These guys are all panicking probably, right? And Peter's sitting there with these guys going, man, this keeps up. We're never going to make it. These guys are panicking. And here comes Jesus walking on the water. He doesn't seem to be having any trouble, right? So maybe Peter just came to the conclusion, well, that looks like a better way. I don't think these guys are going to make it. I'll join him, right? <laughs> think about that. So let me ask you this. What do you think would be a better way to cross on a dark, stormy night? To row on a boat with a bunch of terrified guys? Or would you rather walk on the water with Jesus? If he was holding my hand, yeah. Okay. Because you, you realize that when Peter started this, he was doing okay for a little bit there. Right? As long as he's keeping his eyes on Jesus. And, um, and then what happened? Okay, so here's something I want us to realize. When we are struggling with a difficult situation, as they were, and we're trying to walk in obedience to what God calls us to do, like Peter's doing, right? You know, he says, if it's you, let me come out on the boat, you know, on the water, out of the boat, onto the water, okay? And so Jesus said, now, if Jesus said, no, stay in the boat, that would have been one thing. But what did Jesus say? Come, okay? Which surprised me. I thought he would say, stay in the boat, you know, but... He, he says, come. So Peter's doing what he said, right? So he's trying to walk in obedience to what God called him to do, to walk on the water. And you've been, he, these other guys have been trying to solve this problem, getting to the other side on their own, their own strength, with their own limited resources. 
Now, you, you guys ever relate to something like that? You ever try to do that? I do that all the time. It, yep, and that's, yeah, it gets us in trouble. So, uh, what could we learn from uh, Peter's example in this story in terms of what to do? Well, I think you got to realize one thing here is that when Peter walked on water, it wasn't because he decided that would be a fun thing to try and do. Right? I mean, you, you didn't see him uh, on the shore after the feeding and thought 5,000 saying, man, that was so great, let's go try to walk on water now. That wasn't Peter's idea, right? What he was doing, he did it because Jesus was already walking on the water and Peter wanted to join him in what he was already doing. Okay? So that's different than just saying, uh, let me go show off and show you guys I can walk on water. Okay? Which, of course, he couldn't do, really, right? But Jesus was already walking on water. He was having no trouble getting across the lake that way. These guys were having a terrible time in the boat trying to get across. And so Peter's conclusion may have just been, you know, I'd like to try it your way. That sounds a lot better to me. And that's a good conclusion to come to, I think. When we're struggling with things in our own lives, we're trying to do things, even what God's called us to do on our own, rather than saying, well, I'm going to just keep banging my head against the wall. We can just say, you know, let's do it your way, Jesus. And joining Jesus in what he's already doing, I think, is an important part of this. We can't walk on water just because we say we want to. Right? We can walk on water when we see what God is doing and we say, I want to join you in doing that. Because that, the power comes from him to do the things that he wants us to do. Right? <laughs> was Peter able to walk on the water? He kept his eyes on Christ. He was joining Jesus in what he was already doing. He wasn't just trying to show off and do something on his own. Right? He had faith. Right? That was a key element there. Yeah. He had faith up to a point, but he had faith, right? He had enough faith to get out of the boat and actually start the walk, right? I mean, think about that. Would you have that kind of faith? That's pretty scary stuff, right? All right, so what made Peter start to sink? He already mentioned here. He took his eyes off Jesus. He's looking at the storm. Instead of, you know, Jesus said, come. He stopped coming. Didn't keep doing what Jesus told him to do. He stopped, looked around. This doesn't look right. I don't think... This is normal, or whatever he was thinking, you know. Okay? And what, here's another key thing. What did Peter do when he started to sink? Lord, save me. Good response, right? What if he'd done something different? What if he said, instead of Lord, save me, he said, oh, shoot, this isn't working, and he started swimming away. <laughs> Forget you. Right? You ever thought about that? That might have been a, a response. And how many of us do that kind of a thing? Have you known people who've done that in response? Jesus is calling to do something. It's not going well. Things are going bad. And they just give up. They say, forget this. I tried it your way, God. And they turn their back on God and they go the other direction. Okay? Try to swim out on their own. And then they sink and, you know, get in more trouble and those kind of things. That could have been the response. But Peter's response here was an excellent response, actually. He started... To say, you know, come. Now, when Jesus heard Peter say, help, I need your help, what did he do? Now, at that point, he didn't say, oh, you little faith, get up yourself, right? And that's not how God does with us. When we're trying to do what God wants us to do, and we're having trouble, and we do the right thing, we ask him to help us, right? His response is always like this. He reached out his hand and helped him up. Now, at that point, after he'd helped him up, then he said, oh, you have little faith, right? Why did you doubt? Pointing out the fact that that's the reason why, you, you know, you didn't keep coming to me, and so you didn't keep following me, and, and he was letting him know about that. So his failure to do what he told him to do, the response was, I'm going to help you. Not, well, forget it. You wouldn't, wouldn't do what I told you. All right. Okay, so, all right. What does Jesus ask us to do as his followers that's just as impossible as walking on water? Can you think of anything that Jesus asked you to do that you probably couldn't do on your own? 
what? Being able to walk in obedience to what he's asking you to do, and he gives you the to do it, and yeah, that's important. Yeah, we need to do it that way. Okay, what other kinds of things does Jesus ask all of his followers to do that we couldn't do without his help? Can you think of anything? Yes. Yeah. To witness for him, to help reach a lost and dying world with his love. Can we just go out and say, okay, I'll take care of that, don't worry. You know, like these disciples, when they said cross the boat, you know, cross the lake in a boat, Jesus told them to do it, they probably said, oh yeah, we can handle that, we're fishermen, you know, we can go, okay, no problem. I mean, it might be a little bit difficult in the middle of the night, we can go do that, and uh, we'll meet you on the other side, Jesus. Okay? But, if we try witnessing with that kind of attitude, is that going to work very well? Because it's really God's Spirit that enables us to reach the world, not ourselves, right? If we try reaching the world by ourselves, we, we can't do that. So that's one thing that I think would be impossible for us to do, reach the lost and dying world, without God's help. What else? Love others. We just had a series here about love, right? If, if we were listening, one of the things we learned is the kind of love that Jesus asked us to do is impossible for us to do without his help. Right? We try to love on our own. We always fall short. We always get frustrated. We always you know, get mad at that person for not loving us back or whatever it is. Right? Yeah. To continue walking by faith to trust in him. Again, impossible on our own. He's the one who really gives us the faith. Okay? So... And you can think of other things. If you think about the life that Jesus asked us to live, we can't do it on our own. If we try to do it on our own, we'll fail. Okay? So what do we need to do in order to do these impossible things? Would someone read for me John 14, 12 through 14? John 14, 12 through 14. Here Jesus gives us the answer to this question. When Jesus asks us to do these impossible things, he's not asking us do them in our own strength, in our own resources, with our own power. He's saying, basically, I'm going to do it through you. But I'm going to be the one doing it still, but can I use you to do that? Okay? And if we keep that in mind and, and we uh, face situations trusting in him, that's when we can walk on water. We can't do it without that. Okay? All right. When Peter said, Lord, save me, he was realizing and admitting his need for Jesus. And that's what we all need to do. We don't need skill or talent or intelligence or strength or stamina that comes from our own resources to live the Christian life. What do we need? We need Jesus. Okay? Now, the things that he calls us to do, there's nothing more worthwhile or satisfying that we can do with our lives than to allow Jesus to build his eternal kingdom through us. That's what we're created for. When you accept this as your purpose for living, your life will have new meaning and power. You'll be able to walk on water or move mountains or any other impossible thing that God asks you to do. Why? Because it's not you doing it. It's Jesus doing it through you. We live in a world in which our enemy, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. This is 1 Peter 5. And starting with verse 8 there. He wants to devour people like you and me. And how does he devour us? If, we, if he can blind your mind to the truth of who Jesus is and his will for your life, he's devoured you. If he can convince you that God would never... Uh, love you or use a person like you to do these greater things in his kingdom, then you're being consumed by the devil himself. If you can, if he can get you to consistently choose temporary gains or meaningless pursuits or selfish pleasures over eternal rewards and laying up treasure in heaven, then you're on his dinner plate and he's ready to eat you up. But if we resist the devil and stand firm in your faith, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, it says in 1 Peter here, will himself restore and make you strong and firm and steadfast. In other words, he'll give you the ability to walk on water, to do those impossible things that we couldn't do without him. Okay? 
So instead of being devoured by the devil, he will use you to do these unimaginable deeds of eternal significance, quests of much greater value than walking on water or moving mountains. Okay? If we were just given the ability to walk on water and move mountains, how much good would that do? Right? Well, I can walk on water, but I'm not going to help you. Right? I can move this mountain, but that's not going to help you. I'm just doing it to show off. Is that going to do anything? No. What God is really wanting us to do more than any of those things is those impossible things that are part of living the Christian life, living God's way. So, the title of this chapter in my book is, you know, why does God ask us to do hard things? Well, maybe he wants us to realize our limitations and how little we are really capable of doing without his, depending on him for help. Maybe he wants us to feel the need to cry out, Lord, save me, so that our help, in our helplessness, it can turn into a more powerful meaning relationship with him. When we realize how impossible many things are for us on our, to do on our own and how we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength, we're more likely to seek Christ and his strength in our lives so we can accomplish the purpose for which we were called and give him the glory that he deserves. If he made our lives too easy and there was no testing of our faith to produce pers perseverance, then perseverance couldn't finish its work and we wouldn't become mature and complete, lacking in nothing, like James says in chapter 1. The hard things in life are designed to help us grow and so that we can all become all that God wants us to be. It's part of God's wonderful plan for our lives. And if we can accept that, that's the only time we're really able to do what James tells us to do. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. Right? If we don't understand that God's working through those, it can't be pure joy for us. If we understand the work that he's doing, then that, that's, a, that's something that's actually we're able to do. just want to conclude here with a song. And uh, if I can get this to work over here. And th this song is a prayer. Lord, it's you who's brought us here, so help us, Lord, to just draw near and find in you all that we need. Lord, it's true. Lord, to simply stay here in your presence to find all we need. You're the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the giver of all life. And every perfect gift, the one who plants his work. Let's see. Grower of the sea. Lord, it's you who's brought us here. So help us, Lord. To just draw near and find in you all that we need. Each temptation that we face is common to all men. But you provide your strength for us so we don't have to sin. And when it's wisdom that we lack, you're generous to all. Your armor gives us strength to stand so we don't have to fall. Ooh. 
Lord, it's you who's brought us here. So help us, Lord, to just draw near and find in you all that we need. Lord, it's you. Let's go ahead and just dismiss with a word of prayer. Father, we are so thankful for the life that you've called us to live and that you give us the means to do it as we follow Jesus and we give our lives wholly to him. As we face this new year, Lord, I pray that you would help us to look for those opportunities like Peter did where we see what you're doing and we desire to join in with you in what you're doing. And then you allow us to walk on water, to do the things that would be otherwise impossible, to touch people's lives in unimaginable ways as we trust in you. Give us that kind of faith we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.